Um, in terms of uh, like your in, in terms of your powerlifting, you know, a lot of powerlifters, especially like maybe a couple years back, a lot of powerlifters would just get big and fat. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think I think maybe I made that a little bit too famous or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I'm definitely guilty of uh, you know getting up over three hundred, you know, th- up well over three hundred pounds for yourself. You've always stayed in good shape. You've always stayed uh, lean. Um, I think a lot of the people listening right now would love to know, like, how the hell do you do that? How do you build that kind of size? How do you, because what are you now, like 260? Yeah, yeah, 255, something around that, yeah. Yeah, you look great. You, you keep in good shape. I've never I've never seen you out of shape. You know, how, like, what's the diet like? And, and is there something specific with the training? Obviously, a lot of consistency is built in there. Yeah, I think, you know, it's when you mentioned, like, the history of, like, very overweight powerlifters, I think, and it's interesting, because so many times when I've, talk to people who you know, and say oh i'm a powerlifter they're like well, you're a powerlifter but i thought those guys are all like really fat you know and <laughs> and it, it, you know part of me wonders about to what degree that's like selective memory on people's parts you know what i mean because like ed Cohn was right. jacked. kurt karwaski was jacked i mean there's you know plenty of examples of jacked weightlifters and powerlifters going back a long ways strong men i mean kazmaier john paul sigmerson i mean these guys are kazmaier looked awesome yeah these are the 80s you know what i mean so but i think people there can be a lot of resentment and jealousy you know where people are like oh wow that guy's so much stronger than i am i'm just gonna focus on the ones that are really fat and assume assume that they're all really fat you know um so i think there can be misperceptions there but um for me you know i've always been lean you know and yeah, I think of genetics in that sense. Like, you know, my mom is thin. My dad is big framed, but, you know, on the you know thinner side. And so I'm lucky in that regards. Um, you know, uh, I'm grateful for that. As far as like my diet, I, I do. I mean, I, you know, when I first started getting into fitness, I mean, this is like age 10 or 11, I started reading nutrition labels, you know, and actually I, I remember I started drinking uh, the ultra slim fast shakes. Mm. Remember that time? Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and, and it wasn't because I was trying to get thinner is because these those were the first meal replacement shakes you had vitamins minerals protein calcium all that stuff and so i would drink those um and you know and from there it's always like okay i'm gonna not consume too many sweets too much junk food i'm gonna try and get protein with every meal um and i'm gonna stay physically active and it's gonna that's where it's at like i've never been a calorie counter a meticulous dieter it's just kind of like and i like to follow the 90 percent rule you know what i mean it's like if and again, that's the the perfect is the enemy of the good. I think people who try and have 100% of their meals perfect, they're always going to fail. But if you look for like, okay, 90%, that's doable. You know, 21 meals a week, that's like 18. So you got three really nice apple fritter, um, <laughs> you know, French toast meals in there, um, but the rest are pretty good. You're going to do all right. So. Pretty much just feeding yourself all the time, not allowing yourself to get too hungry and having large amounts of protein that kind of some of the bait like some of the basics for you yeah yeah i mean and also you know through wrestling and whatnot you know i mean i've I've cut weight and weighed in you know hundreds of times and so i'm very you know accustomed to like how my body reacts to different things and and, and i know you know some tricks to like like you can eat high volume low low calorie foods to feel more full you know fibrous vegetable Mm -hmm. soups things like that high, high water things you know chew gum like watermelon or something you can get a pretty good amount of watermelon and it's not that calorically dense exactly celery or as you said vegetables yeah celery broccoli all that stuff you know and then you know if you're trying to avoid eating i mean i'll just chew gum you know what i mean if okay if i'm chewing gum that means no no eating and uh you know it can be hard but i mean anything worthwhile doing is probably gonna be a little bit hard <laughs> how about the cardio side of things for you like even throughout your lifting career did you uh did you do cardio to an extent consistently i know I, I don't know if you grappled at all during that time but how was that for you so that so that actually that's that relates kind of on my my development within the sport so i you know, coming up wrestling i did just tons of cardio i mean we were running all the time not just to lose weight but for conditioning it'd be distance runs interval sprints buddy carries up and down the stadium steps like just a ridiculous amount of that and you know uh and then the wrestling itself of course is very you know uh uh, anaerobically anaerobically taxing um and then brazilian jiu-jitsu as you know very well is also a part of that so i had a lo- very extensive cardio background before i got into powerlifting i got into powerlifting uh, my first competition was actually right after i had finished the fire academy and so the fire academy is also very metabolically taxing you're kind of moving constantly you're 
dragging very heavy fire hose, you're moving ladders, you're in turnouts, which are inherently heavy and very hot themselves. So I was doing a lot of cardio there. And um, so I always felt like I had to do some kind of cardio. I think one thing that helped me make a lot of progress early on was I, I backed off some of that cardio. You know what I mean? Like not to nothing, but significantly less. And I even remember in high school, like I had friends like at the gym who just knew me from weightlifting and they were like, dude, think of how strong you get if you just stopped wrestling. You know what I mean? And I'd be like, well, I'm not going to stop wrestling. You know, <laughs> but, but I'd think about that, you know, because who doesn't want to be stronger? And, you know, also early on in my powerlifting career, I was getting back into wrestling. I had actually just, I'd run some guys at the gym. I learned about some some wrestling clubs in my area. And actually there's a high school that has a very good uh, head coach. Um, and they had at that time a very good heavyweight. He placed two times in the California state. You end up getting a scholarship to wrestling college. But when you're a, a big guy and this is both in jujitsu and wrestling, it's hard to find training partners, mm -hmm. you know? And so like they, they brought me in to train with this, this kid. And so I wrestled with him a lot and I was like, Oh man, I, I love this, uh, you know, but I was trying to do both. And it's like, I always use the analogy, you chase two birds, you miss both of them, you know, and I'd go wrestle from like three to five because their practice were at three. And then I'd drive to boss barbell and I'd lift and I'd be like, my lifts are, are kind of down, you know? And, I, and uh, I had that realization and it, and it comes also to the realism that we were talking about earlier. It was like, I'm a very good wrestler, but I'm a excellent power lifter. You know what I mean? And so it was kind of triaging mm -hmm. and, I, and I realized, okay, I want to be the best power lifter I can be. So I stopped wrestling and uh, cut back on a lot of cardio. That being said, I think I maybe went too far in the direction of no cardio for a while. And the more I have always been a student of the game, you know, learning, you know, from, from you and Stan and folks talking about walks and bodybuilder friends of mine, you know, the concept of medi low to medium intensity cardio took a long time for me to appreciate that because coming from a wrestling background, it was always just balls to the wall. Like you're running, you're running as hard as you can. So it was high stress, which is painful. You know what I mean? If you're go, go run five miles as fast as you can, you know, like that sucks, you know, but like, so it took me a while to actually appreciate, okay, I'm going to get on this uphill treadmill and I'm going to not let my heart rate go too high. I'm not going to go too fast, but it has all kinds of health benefits. So a couple of years ago, I started incorporating more of the steady state, low intensity cardio, and it didn't impair recovery much. It felt better. It, there's a, just so much research supporting it, both for psychological and physical benefits, that I think I'm at a good place now where I balance it. You know, I do that with the lifting, and so I've kind of evolved. Yeah, even just uh, training at like 135 beats, I'm sure it varies a little bit for each person, but there's a lot of uh, research on that. Uh, training in that zone for 30 to 60 minutes a day um, can be really beneficial and it can open up the left ventricle of your heart. That's where, you know, most people get kind of clogged up. So it's, it, it's wise to try to find some sort of training and, and walking is not enough. Walking does not get you there. Um, but walking is a great start. Yes. You know, walking is an excellent start for anybody that's listening. You could also just, when you lift, when you work out, you could maybe wear a heart rate monitor, maybe uh you know, track, track your heart rate in some way and just try not to take a lot of breaks, try to keep moving. Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, earlier, uh, I was talking about how I love supersets. And so before I got into powerlifting, when I would go to, you know, commercial gym, a lot of times I would superset, you know, I do antagonistic movements. I'd row and I'd bench, I'd press and I'd pull up. I would do a quad movement and a hamstring movement. And I loved that because one, it saved a lot of time, but it also created that cardio metabolic effect, kept my heart rate up. Um, it doesn't really impede the strength you know, right. it, because it's the opposite muscle group. Yeah. I mean, there's even might, some, might pull away from it a tiny bit sometimes. Right. I mean, in, in, in some sense it could even potentially help it where like, say you're doing curls and tricep extensions, like by definition, if I'm doing a curl, I have to be relaxing my tricep. Mm -hmm. So it's almost forcing you to rest the muscle that you're going to work when you do the tricep extensions and vice versa. So I loved that. Obviously when I got into powerlifting and focusing on maximal strength, it, that's where I started taking longer rest periods and doing less of the supersetting. I still, I'll save the rest, the supersetting more for like accessory movements. Do you mess with much isolation stuff? Not a lot. You know, I, so with my elbow, 
before it, it ruptured, I still had a lot of tricep pain. So I slowly and surely kind of cut out all my tricep isolation movements. Um, I never was big on bicep isolation movements. And that's just kind of because of training economy. It's like you right. only have so many hours Same in the time. day. I'm going to focus on more bang for my buck movements. <clears throat> um, you look like bench squat, deadlift, bent over row, overhead press. You have pull-ups. That, you have that physique. You have that like density to your body. Yeah. And a lot of that came from the habit from wrestling. It was like, well, we're not going to do curls and, and extension. I mean, we're going to do compound lifts, get in, get out, that kind of thing. And so, um, but there is the evolution with that too, where I, you know, I partially tore my right pec. And from that, I started, one thing I started doing on my bench days is a couple sets of really light dumbbell flies with a good stretch before I hit the bench. And I found that that was somewhat preventive of like straining my pecs. It's, it's an evolution. You end up recognizing like, wow, that was actually really foolish of me to uh, not pay any attention to that form and that style of training, bodybuilding or uh, isolation movements. You're like, those things are so dumb. As you get older and you get more mature and you get in the game a little bit more, you're like, ah, oh, I I, that could benefit me because maybe training my bicep will just help the overall structure around my elbow so my elbow doesn't get inflamed and get all junked up and same thing with your pack maybe you know over a long period of time maybe you were kind of you know rotated forward a little bit put more strain on the pack and maybe if you did you know tons of face pulls or rotator cuff work you know maybe you could have uh, avoided some of that right a hundred percent and just to, to piggyback off that you know um our our dear friend Steffi Cohen, um, who uh, she's she's great, and I pick her brain sometimes. And you know, go back to when high school when I hurt my knee. I remember my first day of physical therapy. The guy said, "Never do leg extensions." Okay, and I've had other physical therapists have said that, and they talk about the shearing forces and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So then, fast forward to a few years ago, and I start developing. Um, like some quadricep tendonitis and also re relatively speaking, my quads were a weak point compared to like my, my hams and my glutes, my posterior chain. So I always wanted to bring them up and you know, leg extensions is kind of one of the only real quadricep isolation movements. And so I remember I, I contacted Steffi and I was like, Hey, you know, you're brilliant when it comes to all this stuff. Like, what do you think about these leg extensions? Cause I've been told, Oh, never do them. And it's a shearing stress. But at the same time, I want to like get blood flow to the joint, strengthen my quads, things like that. And what she said is she said, the dose makes the poison. You know what I mean? I'll never forget that saying because it makes so much sense. You know what I mean? You can die from drinking too much water. You know what I mean? Like, you know, or you can die from drinking too little water. Like it's anything is harmful with too much and is can be ineffective or harmful with too little. And so, yeah, leg extension is like, yeah, don't go ham. Don't max out on your leg extension, but you know, put moderate weight on there and do a number of reps. Like that's okay. Like, you know, it, and, and so, maybe even just move your leg on the leg <laughs> extension machine, but don't put your feet underneath the uh, part that has the resistance on it. Just exactly. Or something or use a band or yeah. something. Yeah. And so I think that's just so important. I think, you know, as humans, we tend to want to see things in absolute terms, you know, don't do this hundred percent, do this hundred percent. When in reality, the vast majority of things are actually shades of gray in between. Mm -hmm. So then doing some of those movements to help like, uh, you know, like you're saying, like stretch and open up the pec. Is that the furthest you've like strayed away from powerlifting? Like since you jumped in, because it seems like you haven't deviated from like the ultimate goal of just being a fucking savage powerlifter. That, that one set of flies, man. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was it, right? <laughs> yeah. You're a bodybuilder. Nah. You know, so I do, I do like bodybuilding and. To be fair, I actually do want to get on stage at some point. Hell I, I yeah, do. you would do great. Right. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I mean, it's like uh, pretty much every meet I've done, you know, I've had people be like, "Hey, are you a bodybuilder?" And I'm always like, "Well, no." And they'll be like, "You should, you should do it," you know. And so, you know, you get that encouragement, and then you think back to you know Arnold, you know, my, one of my original motivations, and then Ronnie Coleman's one of my idols. Uh, he, would Dor get, he would get insane, huh? It would oh, be crazy. Yeah, he would get weird. So dope. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I Dorian Yates is another another idol of mine. I just these guys just motivate me, and I want to give it a try. You know, I mean, I've done strongman competitions. Obviously, I've done powerlifting, and I want to do bodybuilding. You know, it's like they all make sense. But for my training wise, in the last you know seven years or so of, of strictly powerlifting, any isolation bodybuilding stuff I've done has been with the intent of helping the powerlifting. Mm -hmm. 